we expect to peak around November, December, which is the colder climates, and then also during April and May, which is graduation season. Over here for the washing service, we expect to have a little bit less or, I mean, a little bit less than half or around half um, of the blankets. For the first year, we expect 350 blankets sold, leaving a total revenue of $42,000. For the washing service, we expect a little uh, less than half, which is 157, leaving a total revenue of $3,000. For the first year, we expect to make anywhere around $46,000. So for our market size, our total rental market is around 307 million. Um, this is all U.S. citizens with internet access. And we got that number because we took the population of the U.S. and we looked at people with internet access. And anyone with internet access can uh, purchase from our website. Our services are a small market. We're starting in San Antonio. So we're looking to target mothers, college students, seniors, and high school students. The percentages you see on the sides there are percentages of mothers in San Antonio percentages of college students. And if we reach that quota, our net revenue of our service addressable market will be around $608,000. As Max said in our last slide, we're gonna be starting our first year in San Antonio. In the second year, we expect to expand throughout Texas and our third year throughout the whole US. Uh, that's why in year two, we expect 100% growth rate, selling around 700 blankets, leaving a total revenue of 85 dollars $86,000 and our washing service is 314 units, leaving a total revenue of $6,200. Year three, that's why we expect to grow 200%. The unit sold is around 2,150-ish um, units sold, leaving a total revenue of $257,000. Um, washing service, less than half, 942 units sold, leaving a total revenue of $18,800. As you can see here, you can see the gradual increase um, of year one, two, and three. Now for the cost. For each blanket, we expect to pay either students or the retirement home elderly um, around $20 per blanket made. The price of fabric per yard is around $11, and we only need one yard per blanket. Um, $5 will be added for any scissors, thread, pins that are needed in case they are broken or need repair. Uh, shipping, this will go for year two and year three. This should be around $7.99. So our total unit is uh, going to cost $43.99. We're going to be selling it for $120, leaving a gross margin of $76. So what is success to us? What are we testing? If people like the quality of the blankets and the sewers and their reliability and the size of the blanket. So of course, um, once we start to expand, we want more sizes, but right now, and especially with our minimal value product, we just want to do a one size just to test that out. And then we want 300 blankets sold in general um, by the end of the year. And then success, a list of our goals would be, of course, 300 blankets within the first year, and then to have a group of hopefully five reliable sewers, and then to have good traction through social media to really get our name out there. So we would first want to start obviously by finding a group of reliable sellers and purchasing their supplies. So that would be around $150. And then we would purchase the website sometime this month. Um, and that's about $120, but we've included the domain and bug fixes into that. And then we would do a liability insurance for two months, which is $30 a month. And any other months we would take from the revenue. And then we would spend the rest of our money um, January through April on marketing, mostly social media advertisements. We are seeking $500 to continue our brand, build our website, hire new employees, and help you relive your memories. Thank you for your time. Nice job, y'all. Great job. Well done. Really good presentation. Very good. Um, cool idea. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a really cool idea. Let me, uh, I've got a few questions. Um, you talked a little bit about price at the beginning, uh, with your competitors. Um, if you'll go back to that for a minute. Um, and that you, you all were different on price. Your, your price point is $120, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
so that I mean, tell me if, if I'm wrong. It doesn't seem like you actually really are different on price if, if repad is seventy five to one hundred and ninety dollars. So repat, it depends on the size and their smallest size is one hundred uh, is one uh, seventy five and their largest size is I think the like a king size blanket. And so that is like different, but they only do t shirts and they do quilts. So okay. it's like a different fabric and different material and it's a little bit heavier. Okay. And we would do um like blankets, softer fabrics, and we would do more than just t-shirts like Krista mentioned you could do a patch of a bridal dress or baby clothes um and so we noticed that anything without t-shirts is super expensive mostly from Etsy though okay got it got it okay and the the uh, tell me a little bit more about tell us a little bit more about your process like if you take a t-shirt or if you take a, a wedding dress uh, and you're going to put a piece of that in the in the blanket are you destroying the wedding dress in your process or are you somehow scanning it? What, tell, tell us about your process. So um, it depends on what you send in. If you sent in a bridal dress, we would probably take a piece of the fabric from the inside. Um, so you wouldn't be able to tell, but something like baby clothes that's so small because of the size of the blanket, you would need a bigger patch. Uh -huh. um, so you would destroy that, but that is kind of the point because it would get it out of your closet and you would have a piece of it to keep your memory, but yeah. you wouldn't need it collecting dust. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so let me, I'll comment. Um, I actually have uh, quilts <laughs> um, because I did this with my boys. Uh, um, so, and, and by the way, that's exactly why. I had baseball t-shirts, all the things from Little League, from football jerseys. And, um, but my friend Nicole Gottsacker does makes quilts and uh, she made each of them and they cut the t-shirt. So that is the concept and I like it. Um, and like I said, I do have one for each and I love the fact that it gets it out of the house. I mean, it, you know, I can retain the memories, but I've got those, those quilts. Um, just a thought, I, I actually like the quilt. Um, and I got to pick kind of the fabric that I wanted. So, so you, you know, you said that, um, and then I've seen, by the way, where they've added socks or you can add all kinds of different things, which that, that is, I think that's a differentiator. Um, and I love the idea. I think it's going to be, you know, Etsy, like I will say, I use that a lot. I know it's a third party, yeah. but I, I've been ordering Christmas presents because right Etsy, now. while it's indirect, it, a lot of people go there to search for things. So if you're competitive and you're different, even though you may have other folks that use Etsy, right, to um, to make things, I think that is still a platform that would get you. Because I mean, I'm ordering stuff from people that are making it in the UK. <laughs> so, you know, um, and some stuff in the US, but that that's a platform that you should think about, um, especially if you're different um, in using. Oh, because that's all. But that, it's a great idea. Something else that you can think about is um, I've seen people do ties, like when, um, you know, when grandfathers pass away, they, they want to keep their ties and, and so they'll make those into quilts. But, um, and, and then, you know, so I'm, I'm with you, I mean, getting rid of all that stuff is a, is a great, great benefit. Uh, but also like on, on baby clothes and that kind of thing, are, are you doing um, true quilts as well? Or is it just these big patches of things, I mean, because you know, a lot of times quilts are yeah. like pieces that are like you know three inches by three inches, but it's just a lot of the yeah. the different fabrics for baby clothes and things like that. That again depends on how much you send in. If you send in only like four onesies, then that makes it a little bit difficult because they're so small, so there would be a lot of extra fabric between the patches. Um, which is why we're also testing the size depending on how many things people send in with us to everyone. But we are looking to expand in our second year more products. So um, pillows or pillowcases or other seasonal things. But the coaches mentioned that we can do a stocking or a tree skirt made out of other clothes. So we are looking to see what size we're just really to see how many things people are willing to send us. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 become, it becomes kind of like fabric. It's just, you know, so it's a patchwork fabric. So you can do anything with. 
Yeah, and you're, you guys are going to have to have really specific, say, if this is the size of the blanket, and that means that you have to send this many shirts or this size. I mean, you're going to, you need to have that so people know what to send. You, um, you can't assume that they're going to know exactly right, because they may send too much, they may not send enough. So I would really think about, um, you know, this is the size of the blanket, and here are what we need at a minimum or a maximum, right? So that they know, depending on t-shirts, if it's, you know, and some of it could be just a special fabric. You could even take and fill in holes that um, within the, the t-shirts and things like that. So. I'm happy to show you my two if you'd like to see. It's almost like you missed the string. Uh, you have to shrink this because I think it's on. Um, Can you capture this? So, for your MVP, okay. how many of these uh, do you all want to produce as part of your MVP? Okay. Just keep moving it over. We are looking no, to hopefully get over. 300 blankets so out by our first year. There you go. And then minimize. Okay. Right. So that's 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 within that's between now and a year from now, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So just uh, just thinking about during your MVP, which is really just the next, uh, you know, yeah, few keep, months, keep but not a whole year. Minimize, minimize. Um, I think it would be good for you all to have a realistic MVP goal, okay, like we yeah, want to do, yeah. and it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be five, um, but sure. but really, it's about it. what do you learn through that process? What do your customers need? How do you guide them? How do you recruit the people to be your sewers? Are they doing good quality work where you're, um, you know, getting feedback from your customers after they receive your product? You know, how did they, you know, did you produce a good product? Was it a good value for the money? Those kinds of things. So I've, uh, you know, you you set a projection, a, a pretty lofty projection, I think for the first year of 300 of these, which is awesome. I love the ambition, but but really think about what do we actually want to accomplish out of our MVP. Uh, actually, for our first um, two months, I think we talked about trying to get 10 blankets out and made in the first couple or like the first month, uh, month or two, just like you said, to see how the process goes. Yeah. Scavenge through different types of yeah, sewers, see so which ones work, which ones don't. But like 10 is our like first official My number we're trying to get out. Okay. To your, okay, to great. Your group. Have you guys met with a seamstress yet? Okay. I'm, I'm the only the comment I'll make um, is that, that because I will say that okay. patching and cutting and, and you know putting these together may be a little bit more pricey than you would imagine because it, it does take a lot of time and you're not just just something I would meet with them to um, see because I think it, it is a little more work when you're having to specifically cut match and get everything in the right format that may. Um, may ch ch add to your cost a little bit. So I've actually met with a few, and I also know how to sew, so I made kind of like an unofficial demo, which is kind of where we got our pricing and our time, and that's how we figured how much we would, how much would be fair to pay the sellers. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, we figured twenty dollars might be uh, fair, like a fair price, but we're always willing to negotiate with the sewers if they feel like they deserve a little more. Yeah, we have wiggle room. Okay. And uh, to answer your question, we've also online. Uh, we've been talking. I've been talking to local sewers um, who are in the area online about helping, and that's within the price range, twenty dollars around. Um, yeah, my other piece of feedback too. We go to what you're going to use the money for. We go to that slide again. This will be our last question. Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I would spend any money at this point on a website. Right? You're in your MVP again. You're trying to get in the link and tell. You're trying to really learn from that. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I, I think you're you're really focused on getting these produced, how much does it cost? How can you learn from that? Um, and that kind of refining your idea, refining your product, and then really starting to spend money on marketing. You may want to spend a little bit of money on marketing right now, just to kind of get a little interest and maybe figure out who your 10's first sales are. But I just, I don't know that I'd spend a lot of money on that at this point. Thank you. Okay, great job, y'all. Well done, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Good luck, y'all. Thank you.
All right, next up we have my local bundle who looks like that everyone's here. Uh, if y'all wanna turn your cameras on and then someone wants to share your screen, whenever you're ready, we can start. Good luck. I think we're ready once Joey gets back. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Are you ready, Joe? Okay. Imagine a gift where you give someone an abundance of choices that supports small business at the same time. We're my local bundle, and we're looking to make that thought into a reality by producing a universal gift card that can be accessed at dozens of diverse businesses around Alamo Heights. I'm Joey Sattel, CEO. I'm Ian Campbell, CMO. I'm Emily Fichek, CFO. I'm Xander Takak, COO. We have two distinct key problems. First, there's the problem of choice. It's almost impossible to find the gift that someone exactly wants. Beside that, small businesses are struggling, and especially in today's times, Local businesses have a very small budget. When it comes to marketing, these businesses need help. We have two distinct key problems. Together, these two, those two problems create the basis of our unique value. We're a universal gift card that gives you a plethora of choice, but our focus is small business. Together, they make a meaningful and positive gift to our community. Our competitors, San Antonio in a Box is a monthly subscription box that delivers local products such as food and gifts to your house once a month. San Antonio in a Box is an indirect competitor. Cure Cancer Card and Mancrate are direct competitors. Cure Cancer Card is a gift card used around San Antonio for a span of 10 days that donates a portion of your purchases to find a cure for cancer. Mancrate is also a gift card that can be used at bigger companies such as Bass Pro Shop and Academy. Our total addressable market is 7 million buyers with 2.9 billion in revenue. This is everyone in Texas that shops at small businesses. Our serviceable addressable market is 386,000 buyers with $154 million in revenue. This is everyone in San Antonio that shops locally at small businesses. Our pricing, our pricing, it's $100, I mean, uh, $59 to make 100 gift cards, and the incentive for businesses would, ba would be based on what the businesses would want to partner with us. For profit, we would charge $100 for the gift cards, and we would have a fee of $10, and this meets up with the um, standards of the other gift card businesses, like Mancrate charges a $25 fee, and Visa charges a $3 fee every time you use it. And the businesses that we would go forward with at the beginning are Memory Lane, which sells monograms and small gifts in Alamo Heights, JS Hotel, which is a custom clothing brand in Alamo Heights, and Denton Dings, which is a paintless debt repair company in San Antonio. So for our three-year summary, in year one, we're hoping to sell 515 gift cards. With 515 gift cards, that would give us a net income of $40,000. We're hoping to grow that by 75% into year two, with 901 gift cards with $71,000 in income. And then in year three, we're hoping to make a big jump of 150% to 2,253 gift cards and $178,000. Our MVP plan. Right now we're working on talking to different businesses in our community and developing relationships with them so they can be a part of our gift card. Next month, we're hoping to partner with a programmer to start developing our gift cards and making them work for all the different systems that stores use to run gift cards. And then in February, we're planning to begin production and testing our gift cards. So today we're asking for the full $500. We're hoping to spend $10 on purchasing our domain name, mylocalbundle.com, as well as $45 to develop our website. We're planning to use Wix to develop our website and $45 will give us a three month subscription to get started. We need $180 to pay a programmer to start working on our gift cards. $75 will purchase us around 150 gift cards to start working with. And then $90 will go towards flyers to start getting our name out into the community. 
and then $100 for paid promotions on social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. For my local bundle, the gift card for the community. Good job with your presentation. Good job. Yeah, well done. Well done. So I have a question. Um, is there, I mean, a little bit, you know, an Amex, like you said, and a Visa card, you can pretty much buy wherever you want, right? So what, you know, how are you going to market this? I mean, are the, the small businesses that you talked about, are they going to pay you a fee? Because obviously if you're, you're only using, you can use the card, but for very specific um, shops. I mean, that's an advantage to them, um, but that also could limit, you know, depending on who you're, you know, who you're trying to sell these to. I mean, I'm just a little concerned about um, how you market this and really um, how do you differentiate yourself? Because like you said, I mean, Visa, I think it's a, I think it's like $3.95 or something, but you said, you know, you're just going to be a $10 fee. So can you? Talk a little bit about that. So the way that we, or the way that, um, so our ten dollar fee is just included in making money to give back to the businesses, and so we're we're still working on figuring out some of the numbers. But a percent of all the profits we make will go back to the businesses, and it. We have a 99% profit margin because creating a single gift card only costs 55 cents. And so we make almost the full $110 back once we sell the gift card. And so our thoughts are people in our community like to support their local businesses. And so by buying our gift card, they get the satisfaction of their money going back to the businesses as well as making their purchase there. And then also we're wanting to put a percentage of the profits towards a charity, which would on both ends make the community support the idea more as well as the business owners. So if I'm a, if I want to buy a gift card, am I, am I spending $110 to get a hundred dollars worth of buying power? Yes, sir. It's um, so we're looking to go to more towards a gift. And then as we uh, shown, there are a bunch of gift card companies such as uh, Man Crate that charge a $25 fee. And so I, we believe that we can go forth with a, a fee as many of these, uh, even Visa does. And so we believe that a $10 fee would still remain um, involved, let people buy it. Okay. okay. So I guess, uh, and then where would, if I'm, a, if I'm a buyer of one of your gift cards, where do I actually buy the gift card? So we're planning right now on selling in shops such as, um, such as, um, I'm sorry, um, Memory Lane. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we have talked to the new owners of Memory Lane and they, are they have a deal with us that they would be on our card as well as sell the card um and then we also want to develop a website and sell from there okay so if i'm memory lane why don't i just sell my own gift card just for memory lane as opposed to selling a gift card that somebody might use at another store besides my store so with this card, we would we would expect more profit and more um, greater numbers than a single store card, just because that people want more choice. And by offering more choice, that also supports local business to our community. We could see a lot of potential buyers, and we could see these businesses benefit a lot from marketing. Okay. 
So, so help me understand. I, I'm going to I'm going to buy a card from you for one hundred and ten dollars, and then I'll be able to to give that card to somebody else or, or use it myself, and 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 I'm going to be able to use it at at, at local stores, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So so now um, so I, I, I'm not sure I understand the the benefit of of this i guess i guess the benefit for the for the purchaser is that if you're going to give it away the the person that you give it to has more um options to use the the card than just to a card like to to just memory lane just to give card memory lane they can use it at different places and so for for the businesses to help you sell those those cards then they're going to get marketing out of this that's that's their that's the benefit for them because mm -hmm. whenever you have the option to purchase the card it will have the list of all the small businesses that we've partnered with and so whenever you buy this gift for someone they can uh about new small businesses in san antonio they might not have knew existed okay and so then when that card gets used at at an establishment then then you're going to have to pay them the hundred dollars so have y'all figured out how, how that's going to work we would have a percentage of the profit go to a charity um which helps marketing and then as well as they would receive a portion of that profit as well it depends on the business we have we're going to come up with a certain uh, plan to um, discuss with more businesses and then depending on the business depending on its success depending on how well known it is we're going to have to conduct profit and the percentage from the okay. so so the difference between the the actual price of the of the product and what the retailer gets is kind of their marketing fee basically yes ma'am okay. So the difference between the... Okay, good job, y'all. Well done. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Okay, we have about a seven minute break. Judges, if you want to take a quick break and you can turn your cameras off and mute, and we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock. Okay, good job, y'all. Well done. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Hey y'all, our um, next team is going to be pitching from the classroom. So just let me know. You might spotlight them so you can see them well. You also have access to their slides on the document I shared with y'all if you need to see anything up close. You can, if you hover over their box where you see Mitchell, you can click that little pin and it should pin them to your screen if you want to see them large view. Okay. All right, guys, whenever you're ready, you may begin. How's it going? We are Flash Trash. We are a business incubator group 4.5. And I'm Mitchell. Cody's not here right now, but I'm Carson. And I'm Gage. And all right, so I'll ask you a few questions to start off. So how long does it take you uh, to take out the trash, typically, like every time you do it? Let's say five, six, seven minutes-ish, right? And how often do you take out the trash? Give or take once a week, I mean, once a day per week, right? And so what we have made is we have made a device that is, makes everything faster, simpler, and easier, right? And what we're creating is a trash can lid that's multi, multi-sized and fits all over your, tra over your trash can and it fits over your trash can and uh, realigns it for you. So you just press the button. It's a diaper genie type of thing, right? So you press the button and uh, it instantly closes the previous trash bag. You pull out that trash bag and it realigns the whole trash can for you, taking off an amazing amount of time uh, because I always have to look around for the trash bags and And so we're trying to reach, uh, ideally we're trying to reach y'all, our customers, um, the people. We're trying to get it in people's house homes. We're trying to get it in the homes of people and try to make it easier to take out your trash. And so like Carson was talking about, our final solution is going to be kind of like the diaper genie. It's going to be a trash can lid that's semi-adjustable to different types of trash cans that will uh, realign itself and drop a new bag uh, as fast as So our main competitor is the Tony Trash Can. They actually are a self-aligning trash can. And so what we're doing is we're making adjustables to all types of trash can sizes and whatnot. Uh, the Tony is very expensive. It's a very uh, luxury item. We're making this affordable for everybody. And uh, we're just gonna show you. So Red right, Sam, so there's about 171 million houses in the, the United States. So that's our what we're trying to address. Uh, it's just about $2 billion of total accessible market. And then we're going to start off slow in the state of Texas. There's about 10 million houses in uh, Texas. And there's our service for just one market, almost 300 million dollars. So a financial model. We're going to sell about 1,500 uh, models in gear one, uh, and then we go up very, very slowly in year two, and then year three we hope to get around 10,000 years. So as you can see, we don't uh, break even until year three. That's when we really lift off and. Uh, really get our business rolling. So a digital prototype. It's just a small sketch, but uh, this is just our vision of what we are trying to accomplish here. And so you can see that there's a compression uh, sock, sort of a feel. And so it makes it very easy to just put it over your trash can any size. And if there's an adjustable rim to where how big your uh, the perimeter of your trash can. And so for testing and measuring, we're obviously going to be giving out uh, trial runs and free uh, product to uh, some influencers, etc. People we think that can grow our business. Uh, and yeah. 
MVP timeline. So we're going to get a professional uh, digital prototype at the uh, next month or so. And then we're going to have a website, media, just giving our name out to people, hoping people recognize us. And then through February all the way into the end of April, we're going to be working on our prototype and we're going to have uh, trial runs for, cons for customers uh, by the month of April. And then we have our what we could do with the five hundred dollars is all right. So we would get the twenty dollars for the logo. Have a graphic designer, outsource graphic designer to help us out with the logo a little bit. Thirty dollars for the domain name to get our name out on Google and whatnot. You know, we got to pay for that. And forty dollars for the digital prototype, prototype to be designed by yet another graphic designer. Uh, Two hundred fifty dollars for building the prototype plus the technology that is needed for the prototype. Seventy-five dollars for materials to design it and actually create it tangibly, and eighty-five dollars for the programming. And then again, we are Flash Trash, the Universal Lid that realigns trash hands-free. We're here for you because we have to take it out too. Thank you very much. <laughs> That last line was great, guys. That was good. Maybe turn it up. So, guys, uh, we explain to me the real, the real problem you're solving for a homeowner. Sorry. Will you, uh, we describe we. What is the real problem you're trying to solve for the homeowner? So uh, essentially, so when I'm trying to, what is it, take out my trash and stuff like that, I always gotta look around for bags, I don't lose them all, run out of them, stuff like that. And then you gotta do a whoosh whoosh thing with them. And that, it takes up time, five minutes to take out your trash and all that, 10 minutes. Because maybe that's just me, but it takes me a little bit. But uh, so what we are designing is instead of you know having to look around for bags they're built in to the lid and they just drop down like a di diaper gene complex you know how it in the little tube drops down yeah same thing except you hit the button it realigns the previous or it seals the previous one you pull that one out and the one's already in there you just throw in your trash right automatic okay so really it's about it's mostly about loading the next bag is that correct? Yes, sir. Right. You're trying, yeah. Okay. So, uh, look, I, I, I do think this is an issue. I mean, every time I, I, you know, I take out the trash or ask, most of the time I ask one of my kids to take out the trash. Next thing I know, I look back in the trash can and the trash bag is gone, but now there's no trash bag in the next, you know, in the next can. Um, so I, I do think this is an issue. I, I'm curious about if there are um competitive products out there and um and is your solution um too complicated right you're you're, you're talking about building a lid that's going to fit every different kind of trash can out there there's all kinds of shapes and sizes and all of that um and spending a lot of time figuring out how does that actually fit properly as opposed to just maybe building a can a whole trash can that is going to automatically reload my uh reload my trash bags well so that's what the technique bit is it's already a self-aligned trash it's basically what we've thought of but like just in the trash can and so what we've thought of is just making the lid and to answer your question uh we're gonna like we're gonna get a good estimate about uh, like the different sizes of the trash can we might make multiple models but at first we're gonna attempt to make it uh, a universal lid and just have it where the like the rim part of the self-aligning uh, part of the trash lid is yeah make it adjustable and then hopefully uh what we're gonna have is this self-compression so where it's sort of like a putting a bag over uh, like some sort of box or something it's just just seals over and it basically fits on multiple sides Okay, just sounds complicated to me. Um, sounds to me like y'all could actually, um, you know, create a, a, a trash can 
that, that does that. You may have a competitor out there, you're right, but, but how could you actually differentiate yourself from your competitor? I just, multiple lids for multiple different kinds of cans uh, sounds pretty complicated to me. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. One thing to think about too, I mean, like when you see, you compare it to a diaper genie, um, you know, well, the whole point of a diaper genie is definitely so you're not touching dirty diapers, but it also, you know, it, it encloses so that you don't have the smell, you know, so to, to Mr. Sauer's point, you know, if you had a, a trash can, you know, and you said this one was really high end, you could still try, try to find some way to differentiate, differentiate yourself. Maybe there's a button you push if they've got something in there and you want to go ahead and seal it, right? And then, and then um, or, you know, just come up with different ideas, but I, I, I like it, it's a problem. And I, I agree with Mr. Sauer, I'll, I may take the garbage out, or the, my boys do, but when they do, there's never a liner when I come back. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a great idea, but I, I it does sound pretty complex. So I think you're gonna need to do some more looking into that, um, how you would build it. And should you go with more of an actual can? Uh, so what we found with the problem was the, with the can ones, is that some people, they'll have a standing can and all that, but the problem with that is that some people have the, the pull out uh, drawers, right? You know, and uh, so you can't you can't typically fit the, the standard can. They have like certain sizes of the trash can they fit in that specific pull out drawer. And so if we just made a lid that was multi multi size or adjustable or somewhat like that, we could just put it onto any trash can versus just having one set size. And I think if you can figure out how to do that, I think that's great. I think you're, I th think you just need to look into it a little bit more. Um, because you're right, that's exactly what I have as a pull out. And so, and maybe, um, I think you just gotta think about how you can, or maybe it's a certain size, and you have, I don't know. I'm not sure how you make it work fit on every size garbage can. Uh, we already have uh, a few prototype ideas for adjustable sizes to the lid that you can just uh, wrench on or wrench off or something like that. And so I believe that it would be there. Okay. The other thing to think of, if it's one size fits all, you know, if it's, you know, it's going to be adjustable, aren't you going to have to have different sizes of trash bags to put in those two? So think that through. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm interested to see what you guys come up with, because it is, like I said, it's a problem. Um, I don't think I have any other questions, though. Okay, perfect. All right, that's great. That's our last question. Then, um, thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And judges, we have about six minutes until the next one.
Okay, it looks like everyone's here. We'll just wait for our judges to come back on. Team, if you want to go and turn your cameras on, I know you're all here, and you can go ahead and present your screen. And then once we have our last judge there on, I'll tell you when, okay, he's there. And just waiting on Teal now. Okay, perfect. All right, good luck y'all. This is Field Talk, and whenever you're ready, you can share your slides with us. Can you guys see them all right? Uh, yes, if you go ahead and present, then we can see them. Okay, perfect. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Uh, hi, we are Field Talk, and um, we came up with this idea a few years ago. Me and my friend were hunting, and we've been tracking this one buck for about two or three months. And so we uh, tracked it to this feeder where we had noticed it was going a lot. And so as we would, we sat there the next morning and it walked right by our feeder and we didn't notice because we were distracted and we didn't realize this till the next day we looked at the game cams and we saw it on there. So that is how we came up with Field Hawk. Hi, I'm Cora Fritz, the co-CEO. I'm Teal Sable, I'm the CMO. I'm Cameron Simons, the CFO. And I'm Alika Brumon, the co-CEO. And the problem our team identified is how novice and new hunters will often miss shots, whether it's because it's early in the morning and they're tired, they're not paying attention because they're talking, playing games, or because the animal walked past in a blind spot. Our solution to this is a two-part system. The first part is the in-case motion sensor, and it can easily be attached to the pole of the deer blind or a tree that is near the deer blind. And once the motion sensor detects motion within 200 feet of the deer blind or tree, it sends a small vibration to a bracelet that the hunter will be wearing. That way it only alerts the hunter and not the animal nearby. Our main competitor is Buck Alert, a motion sensor device that sends light alert signals whenever it detects motion. However, it only detects motion within a 10 foot range. Field Hawk, which is a much more de effective device, detects motion within a 200 foot range and sends a buzzing signal whenever it detects motion. Light alerts can be very easy to miss if you don't keep your eye on the product at all times. Buck Alert also has many bad reviews stating that it doesn't work and has an average of two stars. So for our customer segment, this is the ages. It's based off the ages of novice hunters and the parents of novice hunters. So our biggest range is about 50%. And this is the ages of nine through 16. Since the youngest age you can get a hunter's license is nine. That's typically an immature age. So they will most likely not be paying attention during the sport of hunting. The next biggest segment is about 25%. And that is the ages of 31 through 45 which is the average age of parents who have a child between the ages of nine through 16. So they would also be using this product mainly because they would have bought it for their child and they already have it, so they'd be using it. And then our next two segments are smaller. Those are the ages of 17, 17 through 30, and also the ages of 49 and above. And we suspect that they would most likely lose or use this device less than a younger age because they are more involved in the sport of hunting. So for our buyers, we did it a little differently. Our biggest segment was the ages of 31 through 48, which was the parents, because we detect that they would be buying it more likely than the ages of nine through 16. Your pack is unique because it helps novice hunters learn how to hunt when they're learning how to hunt. It keeps field, uh, hunters alert when they're out on the field hunting, and it also helps eliminate the blind spots. For our total uh, TAM, total addressable market, I did based on the total U.S. deer hunters, and then I narrowed it down to SAM to only the Texas deer hunters of 110,000. And then for our cost of goods sold, to actually make our products can cost $55 for the motion sensor, $13 for the uh, transmitter to the bracelet and about two dollars for bands and protective hard cases we're going to sell it for 150 dollars based on the quality of our product and how it measures 200 feet instead of 10 feet and how it just just better and then our gross profit is 52 percent and then our one year review is going to be a, t a total revenue based on 144 units sold of twenty one thousand dollars and then our year two projected growth is 200 percent 
Uh, for our MVP, uh, once we develop a successful prototype, which we are in the midst of uh, producing right now, then we will go on to our distribution channels, which will be door-to-door uh, -door selling and on a website at first. And then once everything gets going, then maybe to commercial retailers like Academy and Bass Pro Shops. Uh, we'll measure success by having a positive uh, growth and net profit by year one. So currently we are exploring all of our contacts to see which people can help us develop our product. So by December 18th, we can start gathering all of our contacts and reaching out to them. So we can start further developing our product on January 4th of 2021 to start testing and finalizing our product from January 21st to February 14th. So we can start selling our product on February 18th. Today, we would be like, like to ask for the full $500. The way we would like to spend this is we want to put $350 towards actually making our prototype, paying manufacturers, finding where to do it. For $50, we'd like to spend this for advertising, and we'd like to reinvest the last $100. We thank you for listening to our pitch, and we hope that we can be your second set of eyes. Uh, good presentation, you all. Uh, nice job. Uh, so uh, I've, got a, I've got a few questions. I'm a deer hunter and taught others how to hunt deer. Um, I guess my question is, do you all have any any uh, feedback from people about whether they would pay for this? Whether they would actually, uh, you know, have you have you done any sort of market research to say, yeah, I lost the, you know, I didn't see that deer, but. You know, I, I learned by not doing that deer and I just need to pay better attention or teach my child to pay better attention as opposed to spending $150 for a device like this. Uh, well, so I have asked because I'm a deer hunter too and I've asked a lot of my friends that hunt and as well as helping someone stay uh, more focused, you can also aim it for the haunts of it, so in your blind spots. And so, it could also tell you if there's something behind you, which you really can't really look at anyway. And you usually won't look at because you're always looking at the feeder normally. And so based on those, both of those things, uh, I found that a good amount of people would buy this that I've asked. How would you, uh, how would you differentiate this product from like a webcam that can take a picture and send it to my phone. Well, this one is more accurate and it's more like direct, like right as it's happening, it's gonna vibrate your wrist instead of the cam. It's a little bit delayed by a few minutes or so. Okay, good answer, really good answer. So that, I'd love to have that be part of your, your pitch on this too, about how you differentiate for something like that. It's a great answer. Um, and then, do y'all have any idea about, I mean, you, you had some cost numbers in there about how much it's gonna cost to produce. I mean, do you have any idea about how complicated this is gonna be, how complicated the technology is gonna be to produce something like this? Um, yeah, so we've been in talks with different um, manufacturers. Um, our teammate Cameron is dad is friends with some of them and so we've kind of talked to them a little bit and um we i mean what we estimated it would cost about 71 80 dollars to produce seems like how much uh, it would cost me okay so that you, you got an estimate of how much it would cost that you don't know yet exactly how complicated the technology is going to be okay so my my feedback to you on the on the the ask for the $500 is that every cent of that $500 should be in uh, creating your prototype. Like y'all don't need to be spending a dollar on marketing or anything like that yet. You need to be able to come back to the judges in a few months time and say, we spent our $500 and here is a working prototype. That's all that matters right now is that you have a product that works. So when we like technology based, we've kind of looked at the technology of like a ring doorbell camera. It can be somewhat the same because, you know, 
the text motion or whatever, and then it sends it back to you. So the technology exists. We're just going to purpose it in a different way. Great. I love it. Yeah. And that's, that's all you need from, for a, for an MVP kind of prototype is take technology that's already out there and how do you reconfigure it a little bit for a new purpose? That would be perfect. But all of your money should be going to that is my feeling. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I agree with Mr. Stauer. And, and I think, you know, to that, to your point about the technology, the farther, I mean, you said, I think you said 200 feet, if you could even go farther than that, it's going to be compelling, right? So um, I would definitely um, look into that, but it was a great presentation, you guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well done, y'all. Good job. Well done. You guys did a great job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, judges, if y'all want to stay here, um, we can go ahead and do the next one and then we'll have a longer break in between. Do you want to go ahead and do the next one? That's fine. Five minutes, five minutes. Okay, we'll start at 11.55. Okay.
Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're back. And whenever y'all ready, good luck. Caroline, whenever you're ready to present your screen. Good morning, we're Soteri Stalin Safety Company. As young women, we are being introduced into the real world, and with that comes real world problems, such as the unethical use of date break drugs. To combat this problem, we put our heads together and came up with Soteria, a stylish bracelet with an attachable charm that when it comes in contact with the drug-filled drink, it will change colors and alert the user that there's a drug in their drink, combating the problem of feeling unsafe in a social setting. Now I'd like to take this time to introduce our team. I'm Caroline Mitchell, CEO and Marketing Advertisement Director. Hi, I'm Calista Hine, Chief Financial Officer. I'm Ryan Lucas, I'm Chief Marketing Officer. And I'm Heidi Hankinson, Chief Information Officer. Soteria, the ultimate safe word. Now the word Soteria derives from the Greek goddess of safety within companionship. It is our company's goals to make our bracelets every woman's most valuable companion. So Terria is stylish. With a wide range of colors and styles, it will be sure to be wanted to wear by any girl every day. Our product is safe. Our number one goal for Soteria is to offer our customers with safety and support. While wearing our bracelet, you never have to feel uncomfortable during your night out because Soteria will give you the upper hand on someone who thinks that they can get away with their bad decisions. A Soteria bracelet above all things is discreet. You can pair it with any of your bracelets or jewelry and never be able to tell the difference. This makes it that much easier to test your drink in a safe and discreet way. See, our company is not only selling charms, we're not only selling trends, we are selling a reaction and not just a chemical one. Let's put it into a situation, let's say first example, a man walks up to a woman at a bar, this woman is wearing our bracelet, this man thinks nothing of it, thinks it's just a regular charm bracelet. That gives that woman wearing our bracelet all the more power and knowing that she's in control of her own situation because she is. Now let's say second situation, worst case scenario. Another man with worse intentions walks up to that same woman wearing our bracelet, but he recognizes that it is a Soteria bracelet. And he thinks, wow, that bracelet right there will single-handedly call me out on my bad intentions. So he's gonna turn around and walk out that door and think twice before taking advantage of a person in a bad situation. Now our bracelets are more, and that's why we're asking for more, not just for us, but for anyone who has felt that they have been subjected to these drugs. Now, before I play this video, I would like for you to keep in mind the subtleties of these offenders. With this video slowed down, we can see just how easy it is for this, these man's actions to go unnoticed. Now, statistically speaking, one of 13 college students have gotten roofied or suspect they have been in contact with these drugs. If we compare that to a st major state college like the University of Texas in Austin with over 50,000 students in attendance, that means there's around 4,000 students who have felt like they have been subjected to these drugs, and an even larger number with the 54% that go unreported. In 2016 alone, there was over 320,000 date rape drug product cases, and with our Soteria bracelets, we wanna bring that number close to zero. While we commend the efforts of our competitors, they just don't quite hit the mark like Soteria does. All three of these products, Xantas, Test Trips, and Drink Savvy, 
do use color changing technology, but they're very obvious and convenient and they're one time use only. While using these products, it also makes it very obvious to the people around you what you're trying to do, which defeats testing your drink in a discreet way. Soteria is at a higher value than all of these products because we are discreet and multi-usable. If we take a look at our total addressable market, this would be all women in the United States that we could potentially reach throughout their lifetime. With our retail unit price of $50 and our wholesale unit price of $25, this would give us revenue values of almost $4 billion and $2 billion. If we look at our serviceable addressable market, this is who we want to reach right here, right now. Women in San Antonio, Texas, ages 16 to 26, possibly in a sorority, and we even take into account affordability. This would give us revenue values of over $700,000 and almost $400,000. In year one, we expect about a total revenue of almost $50,000, which comes from our unit sales in retail of 400 sales and in wholesale of about 1,110 sales. Now you can see a very large growth in retail of about 300%. That comes from after year one, we would like to start up our website to create a more direct relationship with our consumer, which is why there's such an exponential growth. In wholesale, we have a 100% growth because we would still be selling to boutiques around the United States after year one. If we look at our gross profit margins, these may seem high, but we do have a low cost per unit of about $8 and are selling for 25 and 50. This gives us a lot of profit to put back into our company and increase our market. And we think that this number is viable because of how valuable our product really is. We are completely confident in our numbers. That's why we are asking for $500 from you here today to continue our testing period. We first asked for $130 for 15 bracelet prototypes, priced around $8.38 per bracelet. This mock-up perfectly breaks apart the pieces of the bracelet that we really want to focus on and how we expect for it to work. With our charm, our main goal is to have it be a sterling silver, but we are testing with our manufacturers other materials that might work with this drug reactant. The bracelet itself, we want it to be a durable metal that doesn't rust, and the way that we want it to work with the purple representing a tampered drink, it shows that when a woman or anybody drops their bracelet in the drink and they pick it up, it will have an immediate reaction to that drug. We also asked $40 to reserve a website name. We feel the name Soterra really represents who we are and what we want to be as a company. We would also like to ask for $250 to begin official testing with our manufacturer, Drink Smart, Drink Safe. So Mr. Norris can begin testing which charms will react with the chemicals that are in a day rape drug. We will also be asking for $80 for all of our standard jewelry making tools and equipment for our handcrafted prototypes and products. Since the beginning, the four of us have made it our goal to absolutely fall in love with this problem before solidifying a solution. But once we found that our bracelets would be the most reliable and the most convenient, we took that concept and created something that we ourselves would be proud to wear and own. Because in retrospect, we could be our own target market. Now we believe in our product, we know others will believe in our product, and that's why we trust that you here today will share those same beliefs. We are Soteria Style and Safety Company. React with confidence. I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Wow, that was outstanding. That was outstanding, guys. What a wonderful Thank presentation. Thank you so much. Love the idea, love the presentation. Y'all did a phenomenal job, really just thinking through your product and how it's differentiated, why it matters, um, outstanding. Mm -hmm. So my internet was messing up a little bit during this, this whole thing. So tell me, you, you said you, you like your name. Tell me what the name means. The name itself is derived from the Greek goddess of safety within companionship, Soteria. And we really feel like that embodies what we want to portray as a company because we are really here for our consumers more than anything. That's great. So so the technology behind the, the charm, 
turning the color. Um, I mean, that's that's already out. It, it's just chemical. It's it's solely chemical. There, as you can see in our other products, those are. I mean, in our other, in our competitors, those are um, products that use color changing technology as identification. But we wanted to to make something more convenient for our users. And to Ms. Ford's point, that was going to be kind of my question is, um, I know that you mentioned the competitors, it's the, the strips and it gets to one time, it's not convenient. Love this idea, right? I think this is great. But, um, but you do think the technology as far as being able to turn a piece of, you know, um, I think you said you wanted a little charm to be st sterling silver. You think that technology is there that it can change based on this specific drug or drug with our research we do believe that there is technology in place but that's why it's important for us to get this money to have official consulting with our manufacturers mm -hmm. to further prolong the, the testing period and so we can figure out what material exactly works with this reaction okay yeah that, that would be my everything was great i think um that was my only i guess concern was you know if it's, you know, a test strip is one thing, but if it's a piece of metal, you've got to have the right chemical uh, reaction there. And I don't know if that exists or not, but this is, I mean, I love the idea. So it could be for your prototype, it could be as simple as, um, as having that little charm actually hold the test strip, right? That where it could react with the liquid and you can see through a hole or something like that in that charm, uh, whether uh, the, the S, uh, you know, maybe the, the S is a hole in that charm for your soteria, and if it if it's changed colors on the inside there, um, then you know there's a reaction, and if it hasn't, then there wasn't a reaction. You could actually just um, put in new strips as as you used it. You know, yeah, you once open it back, open the charm back up, put another strip in, and you still have the discrete piece in there. Um, anyway, I I love it. I've got a daughter going to college next year um i will i will be your first customer um so i really really want you all to get this done this is outstanding that's a great idea uh henry about putting it inside and then the, you can change it out if if you can't get to that technology but that it that's an absolutely fantastic idea um and then i think it's like after you um which you also might want to think yes it's great to have the whole bracelet and the charm but even just selling the charm that you could add to an existing charm bracelet or something yeah. there's lots of different you know and that would be very easy to do if somebody just said hey i've got my own bracelets i just want the charm you they could add it That's you, right. well and, and also having the the strip inside if if the the next drug that comes out doesn't match what the last drug did you know then you could you could get a different strip and and it would still be usable yeah, and you've got ongoing revenue at that point too, right? Because not only are you selling the bracelet that one time or the charm, you've got people continuing to buy those strips overall. So once you have a customer, that customer over their lifetime is going to continue to bring new revenue to you, which is a great business model. Yeah, this is awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I have a question. Am I on? I can't figure out. Am I? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, I like. Your, I love your idea. I think it's incredible. But what I don't understand about these strips is, do you go to, to a party with a with a purse full of these little strips so you can keep uh, replacing them inside the charm? That's exactly what we're trying to combat: is the convenient factor mm -hmm. having pulling out those strips is not convenient in any way right. and it could potentially be embarrassing. So having that discreet bracelet and I think having it, the strip in the bracelet is a great idea. You put it in there before you go out. I think it's a great idea that we will consider during our prototype period, but we are just trying to eliminate the embarrassment, the inconvenience factor with our product. But if you don't have the strip, then, the, then every time you test, does then the whatever mechanism go back to normal and then it's ready to be tested again? Yes, our, we plan on our bracelets being reusable. Okay, I think it's wonderful. Good luck. Thank you. I'm really proud of y'all. Go do it. Yeah, 
Thank you. Great job, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can we all can stop presenting and thank you so much. Well done. And judges, we have a break now until 1225. So you can either mute and your camera and microphone or you can join back in 15 minutes.
All right, team, it looks like we're all here. We'll just wait for our judges to come back. If you all want to go ahead and turn your cameras on and you can start sharing your screen. When all of our judges are here, um, we will begin. It's almost time. Perfect. Okay, and whenever y'all are ready, you may begin. Good luck. How many of y'all have gift cards laying around your house that still have money left on them? We do. Did you know that about $3 billion worth of gift card money goes unredeemed in the United States each year? Well, we are gifting back and our goal is to solve the problem of leftover money on gift cards that ends up never being spent. Hi, I'm Claire Dickey, the CEO. I'm Ashley Goforth, the CFO. I'm Cole Dudley, the CMO. And I'm Holden Carter, the COO. In order to solve this problem of leftover money on gift cards, such as $2, $1, or 30 cents, our company will be collecting donated gift cards with remaining balances on them, taking the money off these gift cards, and then donating a portion of that money to a charity. Right now, we are looking at partnering with the San Antonio Area Foundation. The San Antonio Area Foundation donates to individuals, businesses, and nonprofits. We like the San Antonio Area Foundation because we can choose which nonprofit our money will go to. We are looking at 60% of our gross profit going to the charity we choose to donate to and 40% of the gross profit coming back into our company. Gifting back relies on people's donations of old and unused gift cards. We plan to collect these gift cards in two ways. The first way is through setting up small collection boxes in stores and restaurants. For stores like HEB and Target, we plan to set them up in the checkout and self-checkout lanes. For restaurants, we plan to set them up at the cash registers. The second way is through sending prepaid postage with a return envelope in them to our customers where they can send their gift cards back to the return address. We plan to collect the money off of these gift cards in two ways. The first way is the Texas state law which explains that the card has $2.50 or less on it, the company is required to give the customer that money back in cash unless the customer is related with a nonprofit. The second way of collecting money is through gift card exchange websites, such as carpool.com and cardcash.com, where you send them your gift card information and they send you the money back in cash as well. 
Our customer segment will be focused on people from ages 14 to 60. We have put teenagers in our customer segment because they are active on social media and they also receive a lot of gift cards. We have put adults in our customer segment because they are also active on social media. They are more likely to respond to our marketing mail and they tend to shop at stores where our collection bins will be placed. Our direct competitor is Gift Cards for Change. Gift Card for Change allows you to donate your old cards along with purchase new cards and 100% of their profit goes to charity. Although Gift Cards for Change does not allow you to donate cards that are less than a dollar. Our indirect competitor is giftcards.com. Giftcards.com allows you to purchase new cards and a portion of their profit goes to charity. Gifting back is unique because we take all cards at all price points and we believe in taking all the old and unused cards and turning it into something that can really make a difference. For our total addressable market, $4.75 is the average of our four unit prices for the cards. Roughly $1 billion is the estimated amount of unused gift card money in Texas each year. For our serviceable addressable market, roughly $25 million is the amount of money that goes unused each year in San Antonio alone. We have a prototype MVP and we've been collecting cards for three weeks and we have a total of 52 cards with $328 on them. An increase of 272% from week two to week three. We took our four unit costs from the prototype that we've already ran. We chose $1, $3, $5, and $10 because these were the average amounts given to us to the donated cards. Our cost of goods sold will be the 60% we're donating to charity and 10 cents per card for variable costs, such as going to pick up the cards and taking the money off the cards. For example, uh, for a $10 gift card, it would be a $6 donation to charity. The average gross profit margin would be 37.8%. Based on our four unit costs, the total donations for year one would be about $13,000. The total donations for year two would be about $27,000 and the total donations for year three would be about $48,000. For year one, we plan to stay in the Alma Heights community. And then from year one to year two, there's a 100% growth rate because for year two, we plan to stay in San Antonio. We will have more experience, better marketing, and we have a bunch of local ties within the San Antonio community. Between year two and year three, there's an 80% growth rate because for year three, we plan to go into all of the state of Texas, which would be more expensive, take more time, and we will have to form ties with people all throughout Texas. We are currently in the existing phase of our enterprise. These are a few of the sites that we can use to take the money off of the cards. Along with that, we've been in contact with multiple fast food restaurants to learn more about their protocols. Moving forward, we plan to collect um, test collection methods such as personal contacts, email databases, collection bins, and mail solicitations with an anticipated monthly growth rate of at least 100%. A year from January, we hope to have donated $8,000 to the San Antonio Area Foundation. We are asking for $500. As you can see on the screen, this is what we would be using the money for. We would be using the money for advertising and marketing, such as sending out 100 letters, Instagram ads and Facebook ads. We would also be using the money to set up collection boxes at multiple store locations for the information plaques that would go on top of the collection boxes for a domain name and for gas money. We hope you choose to invest in gifting back and believe that the small things that tend to be disregarded, such as leftover money on gift cards, can grow into something big and make the community a better and brighter place. Thank you. Please let us know if you have any questions. Y'all okay, can stop sharing your screen and then we'll let the judge ask questions. Yes, so great job guys on the presentation. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned that in three weeks you had 52 cards and I think you said $328, is that right? Yes, ma'am. So can you tell me a little bit about where you got those 52 cards? Um, we reached out to people around us in our area, family members and friends, and the school around us, and we were able to come up with 52 cards. Okay, that's impressive. Did, I want to make sure no one of the other judges didn't have a comment to make. 
Uh, so uh, great presentation, um, really good job. I mean, I, I do think uh, unused gift cards is a real issue. We've actually, uh, Mrs. Bonar and I have heard a number of pitches along this same problem over the years. Um, I actually think this is this one is really creative mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually simpler than some of the other pitches we've heard talking about, you know, how do we help, you know, create a trading system and all this kind of stuff. And what you all are saying is, we're gonna take this and actually do good for our community, I love it. Um, and, and so I think you're actually approaching people from a different perspective, which is not how do I trade mine, but how do I actually take this thing that's just sitting on my shelf and actually do some good with it, um, <clears throat> which, I, which I love. Um, I'm curious about a few things. One is, um, will, is your company going to be a nonprofit or are you a for-profit business? We are a for-profit business because the Texas state law exempts nonprofits. The one where if the card has two dollars and fifty cents or less on it, you can get that money back in cash. Okay, so um, so if you are for-profit, then how do you how do you deal with um, with the less than two dollars and fifty cents? We it, we're allowed to go and take the two dollars and fifty cents off at this like restaurants and stores because the state law exempts only like nonprofits. So if we're a for-profit, we're able to do that. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not sure I'm totally following, but anyway. Um, uh, so if I'm, if I'm thinking about, um, you know, I want to use my gift card uh, for good. Um, the, the thing that bothers me a little bit about that, me personally, is that, okay, I'm doing this, but I'm also supporting this for-profit company. I think you might get more people interested in, in participating in this if the whole thing is set up as a nonprofit. It doesn't mean you, can, you can't pay yourselves really well. You can still pay yourselves really well if you're a, if you're a, um, if you're a nonprofit. You just can't distribute money to shareholders okay um so you can think about that as a way you know just continue to build this continue to do more good in multiple uh, communities by being a nonprofit. Um, may generate more interest for people uh, and for like restaurants and so on but where you're going to put your your box uh, to be able to say we are completely nonprofit all the way through um, maybe something for you all to really consider yeah, I think you guys have got a real opportunity too, because I, I believe you said there were the other, I don't remember what the cost was, but there were other companies where you could go and get the money if it's more than 250. So I would imagine that, you know, you could get the less as well. Um, but, you know, and you've got an opportunity here because this is something that, you know, you could move on quickly by getting some of these boxes out. Um, you know, to see how well it does. But but to Mr. Sauer, we, we, we have, we've heard so many ideas about this and, but this is the first one I think that is actually, you know, could work. I mean, yeah, I, think it's doable. I mean, I think, I think this one's actually doable. The others were pretty right. complex. So um, good job. Thank you. Well, and, and maybe if you do have the issue with the, the 250 or, or less needing to be a, a, a true for-profit business, Maybe you have a for-profit business, and 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 it does give everything to charity. You can do that, you know, and then have a non-profit business as well. I mean, you can you can maybe you know switch them into two if, if you need to um, to do you have wear different hats in different circumstances. You all should talk further to Mrs. Ford about that. She's the expert and all that, so she can help you big time. I would use her for that. Yep, for sure. <laughs> So can I can I ask you? I don't know which one of you I'm asking this of, but do you have will you have a card reader so that I have like in my drawer maybe some gift cards that I don't want, I don't know how much is even on them. So is there some way to find out what that is before you donate this card? Uh, yes, ma'am. There have been there are a lot of the sites and then there's numbers on the back of the card. So we've just been calling them and finding out that way. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. That's a great piece of feedback right there too, is how do you provide an extra bit of value for your potential donors is for them to know, because some, you all know how to do that. Y'all are much more tech savvy than any of 
okay. than, than any of us are to be able to figure out how much is on our cards. I, I mean, there's a pile sitting right here. I don't have any idea. But if your service could actually provide that extra value to your potential donors, that would be another another thing that you add to your value proposition. And uh, and it may not be that complicated for you to do. Mm -hmm. That's I would, a good yeah, that, Mr. Rubin's exactly right. That is, that's fantastic. It, I mean, it, especially I would think that there's technology out there where you could just scan most of those. I know I mean call and do things like that, but man, that would be ideal because then because yeah. that's that's why I don't want to. I don't know how much is on them either, so it's like that's what I do first. Mm -hmm. Good idea. I love this creative approach to mm -hmm. this problem. I really do. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Good job. Well done. Okay, good job, Bill. Um, judges, we have about seven minutes until our last presentation for the day. Back Thank y'all so much for your feedback. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good, you. Good luck to y'all.
I think we are ready. We've got our team here. We're just waiting on two judges. Just one second. Team, if you want to share your slides, you can go ahead and do that. David, you'll have to unmute before you. Yeah, there you go. Okay, we're ready for y'all. Whenever you're ready, you may begin. Good luck. In November alone, more than $700,000 were lost to online jewelry scams. This fear of being scammed has less has drawn customers away from great deals. Hi, I'm David Graham, CEO. I'm Nico Salinas, CFO. I'm Jack Buell, CMO. I'm Ben Castillo, CIO. And we are Ringleader, an online jewelry resale site that certifies every piece of jewelry that goes through our site. What makes us different is a no scam guarantee. Ringleader has four main competitors, StockX, Facebook marketplaces such as Almohide Trading, Amazon, and Zales. Zales is your typical business to consumer website and has no opportunity for resale. Facebook and Amazon have du dubious deals and you never actually know who you're buying from. StockX has a very similar system to ours, but they're in the shoe industry. We're trying to replicate this business model in the jewelry industry because it's a proven model and it works. Here's our TAM, our SAM, and our market share. So our total addressable market is based off of females ages 15 to 64. Older generations are typically not prone to buying things online. And this is why we've capped the age at 64. Our serviceable addressable market is based off of income levels of $50,000 or more a year, access to the internet, and a preference for shopping online. This leaves us with a market share of 1.08%. So the way we're going to earn revenue is via transactions. We're going to make ourselves the most convenient option by only charging the seller a 12% processing fee. Contrary to the 14 to 15% our competitors are currently charging per unit. And then about 5% of the unit value will go to the cost of goods sold. Meaning that about 40% of the 12% processing fee will go to the jewelers and gemologists who will do the appraisal and we'll verify the or stuff from us. And then five dollars more will go to the box that will secure the jewelry item to be ready to be shipped. Uh, at the end of the first year, we're expecting to have over two hundred thousand dollars of revenue and about twelve hundred dollars uh, and about twelve hundred units sold of jewelry. And then from year one to year two, our projected growth rate will be about one seventy percent. And from year two to year three it will be about 200%. We base those models because our competitors had, have had similar growth rates in the past years. Our MVP will be both a desktop and mobile website and eventually an app. But while these are being developed, we will sell our pieces of jewelry on Instagram. We will buy our starting inventory off of websites such as eBay and Amazon and use our verification process through Stone Oak Jewelers, which is about $40 per piece, to verify these objects and then resell them. Success to us, success to us is selling every single piece that comes through our website. So here's the timeline for our website development. By next month, we'll have the website created and heading towards February, we'll run the MVP to gauge interest. And this will be the time around we'll be, we'll be selling our pieces of jewelry to Instagram, and then by March we'll have the website up and running. We will be asking for $650. $400 will go towards our first piece of jewelry because we want to buy something of a high enough value to warrant the certification process. $40 will go towards the first appraisal, and $100 will go towards paying micro-influencers on Instagram. We are ringleader and we are making shopping safe. Good presentation, guys. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure that I understand the model completely. Maybe uh, you said this is very similar to StockX and what StockX does for shoes. Um, 
so um, I'm just not familiar with this. Can you explain what StockX does and why that model works? Right, so StockX basically allows uh, vendors to sell their used shoes on the site, but then they charge a fee to certify that the shoe is genuine and of the value that the sellers are selling it for. Uh, okay. And we were hoping to apply something similar in the jewelry market. Okay, so if I've got a, if I've got a nice piece of shoes I and I wanna sell them, my buyer is like, hey, I don't know if you really got those, those nice shoes or not. Um, so do I, I send my, if I'm the seller, I send my shoes to StockX, they verify them and then turn around and ship them to the end customer. Is that how it works? Exactly. Right. So basically you sell the shoe on StockX is site and then they sort of, and then they have the shoes go through them to have them certified. So I take the shoe, I take the physical shoes, send them to StockX, they verify them and then send them on to the end customer. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. It's right. a middleman basically. Okay. So, so what you're offering here is a middleman, uh, on jewelry sales so that before somebody pays the full price for that piece of jewelry, it's been certified as it's, uh, that it's, uh, uh, you know, as it's been listed, that that is an accurate representation. Right. Yeah. yeah, so to Mr. Sauer's point, um, I'm very familiar with the StockX because I have purchased shoes for my son <laughs> uh, on there, but, um, you know, and, and it does work. I mean, I, I feel it's a great concept and um, and really, so, and, and that's for really shoes that are, you know, where they only release a certain amount, right? It's these really special shoes that Nike comes out with or whatever. Um, I just don't know what, I'm just not familiar with what the market would be for jewelry. Yeah. That, that's my only, I, I mean, the concept is great. I, I, and by the way, great presentation guys. You did yeah. a wonderful job. Um, I think my only question or concern would be what is the market? Because I don't know that, um, and you know, you're talking about shipping, it could be some expensive jewelry. I just, have you done any research to see, like if you, if you go to all these websites, I mean, are people really trying to sell jewelry? Uh, right. So it sort of works out that um, the same age range that has a higher fear of uh, online scams is the age range that would be buying more high end luxurious uh, jewelry. So we feel so there's a big market from the 40 to 65 age range to uh, try to sell our more high-end items that would require certification so have any of you guys or or do you know anybody that has actually expressed this to you as a pain point look at this piece of jewelry i really man that's something i'd really like it's expensive but i'm worried that that what's being represented to me is not real I, and i want to know if, if somebody expressed that to you as a real pain point well, we actually had uh, one of the coaches who said that he's turned away from uh, buying watches because he was afraid they wouldn't be uh, genuine. Okay, so um, so there's something there, right? Y'all went from a gentleman talking about a watch to women buying jewelry. So you made a leap there. I'm wondering if there's something, back to what Mrs. Bonar was talking about, with the StockX pieces. Uh, the StockX is connected to, there's this release of shoes with very limited quantities that people want. And because it's limited quantities, um, but it's a known thing that um, that there's a real opportunity for scams there. I wonder if there's something like that with watches or sunglasses or, or something like that, where there is a limited release of a product that you all could get your, your your piece of that pie. Well, we're actually hoping to expand to watches in month five of our uh, of our business. So we have laid that out, our plans for that. So why, you, why, why did you start with watches? watches? Yeah. Yeah, I would say start with jewelry. I mean, watches because they were a little bit less expensive too. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Treatment, treatment is different than well since the since jewelry is mostly expensive stuff we 
we took in account that uh, many of the jewelry items we have limited quantity. Uh, it's not like anything else. Maybe shoes are a little, bit, a little bit cheaper, and the more expensive it gets, the more limited it is. So. Yeah, cause the concept on StockX is it's a limited quantity and they go up in price, right? People bid on StockX because they want to get those shoes because they're limited edition, right? So that's that's where they, they're making make money there. Yeah, is there a product that's already being, I mean, is there another product category? Shoes, the shoes piece I imagine, Sue, is that as these shoes get released, there's already a whole bunch of marketing going on, Instagramming going on, um, you know, all of that that's building this demand. Yeah, there's this product, that. right? There's um, is there another product like that where the demand for that product is being built by somebody else that you don't have to pay for? All you're having to pay for is all you're doing is verifying and taking advantage of the fact that there is this big demand being created for a limited product. Yeah, um, that's, what we, I'm sorry, right. that's, what we, that's what we love so much about the jewelry market is that you see seasonally uh, jewelry retailers will put on their huge marketing campaigns where they try to uh, drive up sales like towards Christmas, towards Valentine's Day. Uh, and we we feel as though like we could really chip off of that marketing because as uh as people move in towards these jewelry retail sites they'll also uh they'll also look online for cheaper deals and we feel as though if we can be that a tr trusted cheaper deal we could really uh siphon some customers yeah and when StockX uh, started, there wasn't really, there was still demand for shoes and there were exclusive releases, but StockX was a big factor for those exclusive releases and those high demands. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're not sure if we can achieve that uh, impulse, impulse that StockX made uh, in the shoe market, but we're also hoping that when more people go through our website, they're that we uh, people will look for um, items with uh, a lot of demand and limited quantity. So I'm trying to understand. You get the product, let's say a ring, rather than a watch or a watch. You get the product online. Where do you get this product? Right. So for you our verify it and then you sell it. So eventually we want to get to the point where we're just a marketplace where we have sellers putting up their own items that are being sold. Uh, but until we can get sellers to our site, we'll be buying inventory from either uh, eBay or Amazon and then certifying it and, uh, and then selling it. And the reason why we chose eBay and Amazon is because if you can prove that the purchase you made wasn't genuine, they can force sellers to give you your refund, but they don't do that uh, process for you. So it was a great opportunity for us to test our certification process. And have you thought about locally? Perhaps my husband would have a watch that he no longer uses. I've been on my grandson's so long. But uh, they, would, would there be an opportunity to to verify that through you and then you would sell it, you would donate it. I don't know what your profit setup would be. Yeah, well, that's sure. We would definitely appeal locally. Um, we're actually working with a local um, business, Stone Oak Jewelers, to certify our our objects. So that's yeah, I mean, what we're going to do. Yeah, to Ms. Reven's point, I mean, you know, rather than you going out and buying something that on Amazon or um, you know one of these websites or especially ebay and then you get it and it may not be exactly what it when you spent the money would it not maybe be better for your mvp to maybe go find someone who has a piece of jewelry um to mr even's point and and then go get it certified and then post it and see if you can sell it i mean that could be a different approach i, I think a lot of people would would maybe look into that mm -hmm. Good opportunity locally. 
Mm-hmm. That's definitely a point we want to get to. We were just worried that initially, before we can get our name out, uh, we wouldn't be able to get as many sellers on our site. So we would be purchasing inventory initially. Yeah, I just don't know how much inventory you're able to this Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can, if, if you can get items from, from people that you know and then spend the $500 on on the marketing and, and getting your name out um, and, and marketing those products that you get, that, that might be a better use of your $500. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Well, mm-hmm. definitely consider it. The only thing with the uh, eBay and Amazon buying was it was more a test of not our audience, if they would, you know, access our site and buy our items. It was more a test of does our verification process work? And if not, how do we fix it? If it does, then we move on to the next step of acquiring local pieces of jewelry, then selling it. So it was more of an extra step. Well, I think though that even if somebody donated um, the jewelry, I would still go get it certified to make sure that it's real and that the value and what you're going to sell it for, right? I mean, so I mean, you could still test that, I think. I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's just how you're getting your product, right? And, And so, and it's and it's not even a donation. I mean, you go to these people and you say, hey, do you have extra jewelry? that you want to that you'd like to turn into cash mm-hmm. and yeah you know, so let's you know but but we need you know we need to make sure that this is is good and so we've got this process with stone up jewelers and mm-hmm. and then you you start building your inventory but it, it but the thing is you don't want to pay for that inventory right it's because it's it, you're just you're, you just want to be that middleman and um and and then um and but but test like you said testing your process to, to see that that it truly all, all works and and then you start building a reputation as well mm-hmm. and and that's you know it's just you know then people start telling friends and and you can use your profits to um, to, to build your brand right yeah I, I don't know that I would I mean I, I don't know that I'd be comfortable giving four hundred dollars to test it when I think you could really get some people to give you to to give you not for free but to sell right and you can go you test your certification process and put it on the website and then and you know then somebody buys it you know that that's i'm much more comfortable with that i think that's the focus you need to be yeah and we'll but we also thought about four hundred dollars because we're looking to buy uh jewelry items that uh we hope that they will give us profit so we could continue to um have more jewelry and also put money on the side if we get donations, or, um, it's not a donation. Uh, again, it's it's you're going out and you're finding your inventory rather than you buying it and spending the money when you may not even sell it, right? Somebody may not want to buy it. It's more of you're getting the you're you're finding the inventory from people who want locally who want to sell their jewelry, right? Yeah. It, it's a it's a consignment process. Yeah, and so so let's say that. That the, the piece of jewelry is 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 worth a thousand dollars, and and so somebody's going to pay a thousand dollars for that. Then, but but you don't give the, the whole thousand dollars back to the to the person who gave you the piece in the first place. You take a commission, and so that's how you get your profit. And so you're just you're just, you're just a, like you said before, you're a clearinghouse, but that's how you make your money, and um, and that's how you know. I mean, there's a there's a lot of jewelry in, in jewelry stores today that those jewelry stores haven't paid for. So that's that's the consignment world in the jewelry world is I mean that's that's a big deal already. All right, we'll definitely have to shift our focus, like you said, to probably getting more local jewelry and then selling that. We just thought that maybe buying from eBay and Amazon would more validate the problem as well. Because if we do find an object that, say, is listed for 500 but is actually worth 50 that just proves that our problem is genuine. And scams are very likely on the internet. I'm not sure you have to prove that. I think that's reality. 
I mean, I wouldn't buy jewelry on eBay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. There's no way. <laughs> um, so I mean, I don't. Yeah, from this board's point, I don't. Think you have to prove it. I think that that's that's a given. But but again, you know, it's it's definitely a problem. But you're what you're going to have to do is really be very clear in your marketing of how you are validating the you know that it is um, you know that you're going to these gemologists and you know validating that it is the quality that it says it is. Okay, good job, y'all. Well done. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good job, guys. Very good. Great job. Okay. Well, thank you, judges. That's our last pitch today, and we'll reconvene here tomorrow. Thank you all.